So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, the September 3rd, the 3rd of September, the first Friday of September. And guess what else? It's Labor Day weekend. So if you're enjoying the swimming pools, this is the last weekend that they're open here in the United States. So this is episode number 124 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. So thank you to those of you who submitted your questions through the past week and I hope that one of the questions that you personally submitted is something that we talk about today. What's going on outside? It's getting cold. I know. We had mornings down to the mid-40s this past week, and today it is 65 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 18 degrees Celsius, but at least it's sunny right now. So you could work with your bees. And uh, don't forget that because there's 124 of these, you might not be able to keep track of them. So if you just Click the like button down there, then you'll know that you watch this one. And if you're visiting us via podcast, thanks for listening. It's Podbean, the way to be. And this is the way to be. So thanks for being here. New or returning viewers and listeners, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you so much. Let's jump right into it. The first question comes from P. Grace. I'm also trying the ultimate inner cover for my hives this winter and was disappointed to see that my rapid round does not fit. Any suggestions other than the feeder Smart Bee makes that might work as well as the rapid round? Or maybe a workaround? Yes, I have a workaround. It's no secret that my favorite uh, hive top feeder is the rapid round. What's that look like? This is it right here. This is a wrap around feeder. Why do I like it? I mean, let's just talk about that. Well. It sits on top of your hive, surrounded by a medium super or a shallow super, because this itself is pretty shallow. And what I like about it is that this takes liquid syrup. So you can have one to one or two to one, which is probably what's coming up for a lot of you as your bees try to prepare for winter, two to one syrup for preparation for winter, because they store that. One to one is a stimulant that we use in the spring. Sugar syrup is nothing but a carbohydrate so your bees can stay warm and do the work that they need to do. So, how do we get it into the hive? Well, I like putting things on top because when it's cold outside, I don't want to open the hive. I don't want to release that nice warm air that they've built up inside there and I don't want to disrupt the bees. I don't want to smoke them. I don't want to suit up. So, we have hive top feeders. The problem comes into play that uh, not only does this do syrup, but you can put dry feed in here for winter time too. So, when there's syrup in it, Put the cone on it. This reduces the bees drowning. Most of your bees are going to drown in these if you let your syrup run completely out and then they can get to the bottom and start scooting out into that open surface area. If you keep these full, three quarters full or at least half full, fewer bees will be drowned inside this cone. This cone comes off in winter because now we have dry feed and then the bees can access it and walk all over the entire surface. But the problem and the center of this question is some of the versions come with this little tube extending underneath. See that? Hope it shows. And so when you set this on a board, and this doesn't necessarily only have to do with those Be Smart Designs new insulated inner cover. This is also a problem with people that use the standard inner cover. So for example, just happen to have your standard inner cover. Look at the opening here, it's this oval, and this oval is really designed for a bee escape. So, because it could be used as a bee escape when you're trying to do a honey extraction and things like that, when you're pulling your supers off. But when you take a rapid round like this and put it on here, not only does it not go down in the hole, it stands up, and therefore the bees now have access to this upper area, and what will bees do with that space? Exactly what is indicated on the surface of this interior cover, they make their beeswax all over the place and they fill their spaces, right? So what can we do to put a wrap it around like that on here? This is very simple and when some of you see this you're going to be like, ah, why don't I think of it? You just get yourself a normal pine plank, any other wood that happens to be hanging around. You can buy these at your hardware store, you know, it's sold as a 1x6, 1x8. This happens to be from 1x8 but it's got a natural edge on it. You cut an inch and a half or a two inch diameter hole or anything in between. 
pretty easy. Then you put that right over here. Now we close off the bees access to this space up here. We don't want them getting loose up in there. And now if you've got the one with the central cone here, it goes right into that hole, sits flush. And that's why you want this board to be kind of as large as possible, but still fit in the space because you want it to support your liquid here, which could be half a gallon at a time. Then if it's liquid, you're going to put your inner cover on here. You're going to put this cover on your outer cover. There it sits and your bees have access to the feed, but they do not have access to this overall space. So they won't make a mess. Now, somebody might say, well, Fred, the question was about that insulated inner cover. So we want to see that. Okay, let's do that. Next thing to pick up here is this inner cover. So this I am evaluating this year. We just got them. And so I've been kind of putting them in when I did my recent BVAC video on the Colorado BVAC. So if you haven't seen that, look down in the video description. You might want to see that. Super easy way to collect your bees off the ground or someplace where you can't shake them out of a tree. But this is designed to kind of be in everything in one uh, insulated inner cover. And the reason is you have a reversible foam insert that's an R10. So it's good insulation. And now instead of having it as your insulated cover, which is what I went into winter last year with, I used the B-Max insulated covers on top of my feeder shims. So now the inner cover, so this is intimate contact with your brood area in late winter because we know they start off in the bottom box. As winter goes, they consume their resources, they move up and up and up, and then they're up against this inner cover that now will be insulated. Therefore, condensation doesn't form on the underside, it forms on the walls, and they need that condensation. But some people say, well, I want a vent on the top of my hive. Well, so they made it so this could be vented, and you do that just by reversing this insert. The other thing is there's little clips in here and those clip on the sides and they create a tiny air gap so that people can also vent through the top in hot periods of the summer if you live in a high humidity area and things like that. So they've thought of a lot of different things. Somebody else in the comments that I just read this morning, by the way, said that that cone right through here is super smooth and so they needed to rough it up. Well, I've got 10 of these out of my apiary right now. I have not done any roughing up of these inner surfaces and the bees still come up and they get into the feeders, which I'm going to get to that in a second on how it will work. But honeybees can walk right up smooth surfaces. The reason we like to rough them up in some other areas is where there's a risk of them losing their footing because other bees are pushing them into each other and they fall into syrup. But when they're going up to get somewhere, like up into the feeder that would be sitting on here, then uh, they do get their footing. I don't know how many of you have ever watched a honeybee walk right up a window, a piece of glass. So if you've got observation hives, we know that the bees can climb smooth surfaces. So that's, that's a given they're gonna handle it. But the same adaptation works for this. So you've got the center cover. If you're not using this access hole for the bees to feed, then they include a little black cap right here that closes that off. So then it's just an insulated inner cover with no feeder on top. But with that open, if we just try to put this on like this, you get a problem. See, it doesn't work. But you've already seen what works, and that's to put a piece of wood with a hole drilled in it. Three quarter inch is more than enough. You center it over the hole, just like that. And then you put your feeder on it. And now once again, we've got a hive top feeder surrounded by a feeder shim. Then I put an insulated cover over the top of that, but that's kind of redundant now because the insulation occurs below the feed. So then the bees can get up in here, access dry feed, liquid feed in warmer weather, dry feed in the winter time because it becomes an emergency feeding resource for the bees. But see now the whole thing is taken care of. And then these edges right here support your box so it can be a medium or a shallow super that sits here then you can put another cover over that you will see light through these edges around here and so there is some airflow up into this space so this space is not going to get warmed by your bees the inside of this will get warmed a little bit by the bees as they get closer up there uh, but out here this is not a weather tight area and then an insulated cover goes on that i just do it because they have them so that's the fix for that. So there was lots of buzz about that. A couple of people asked the same thing. So that's it. 
a regular plank you buy at the store, drill a hole in it with a Forstner bit or something like that. If you don't have one, uh, get someone to drill a few of these, make a bunch of these for yourself. And again, that works on a standard inner cover, not just these insulated inner covers by B-Smart Design. I did notice some people were saying that uh, they didn't come with instructions or something, so they wanted to see the instructions. If you go to the B-Smart Designs uh, website, all the instructions are there for you. So there again, that's something that we're just evaluating this year. That's a very easy fix for that. So let me put that sheet right there. Question number two comes from Robert Thornton. What's the deal with murder hornets that we keep hearing about? Are they really dangerous? So if you haven't heard already, there are, it's called uh, Vespa mandarinia. Vespa mandarinia is the Asian giant hornet. It's also what's being called the killer hornet by the journalists that are trying to get lots of people to pay attention to their stuff. Right now it occurs in Washington state in the United States here. And they're big. How big are they? Well, 45 millimeters in length or one and three quarter inches in length. Hey, Fred, what's the wingspan? The wingspan is three inches or 75 millimeters. And uh, they're advising you, are they dangerous? Well, if you're a beekeeper, you might understand stinging insects, but this is the mother of all stinging insects because the stinger is over a quarter inch. Some say right out a quarter inch uh, in length. And this is a big, big hornet, a true hornet. So here in the United States, the only true hornet that we've had well established is Vespa Crabro, C-R-A-B-R-O, and that is a European hornet. And uh, coming up this week, in fact, we're going to be looking at some of those in a tree. So that's kind of cool. But uh, they are very different from one another. So are they dangerous? I would not run up to a tree that had a bunch of Vespa mandarinia, the Asian giant hornets in it, and start thumping that tree with a baseball bat or something to see if you can get them to come out and see what's going on. Uh, they will sting and uh, they'll defend their resources. They defend their nests. They also attack honey beehives. Some people have said, well, how are we going to protect our honey beehives? Well, they're dangerous to a honey beehive because what they do is they take it over, occupy the hive, and defend that location while they completely use up the resources inside the beehive. So they're a nightmare. They're dangerous if you happen to be a honeybee. They're dangerous if you're a human and you go up and you antagonize them. Now the nest that they just recently found, that's right, they found another nest in Washington State. It's at the base of a tree. And uh, you can see in the video sequences, because those are on YouTube, you can look them up. I believe Washington State University or Washington State Department of Agriculture has them posted. And what you see is that the workers are flying out of this hole in the ground and they're carrying chunks of ground with them. So chunks of wood, soft pulpy wood, they excavate and they're shaping it on their own. So it was very interesting. They try to catch them and they try to catch them alive. And especially when they find out that they're out and about and they get individual specimens, uh, they want to catch those live and they want to uh, track them. They want to get them to let them know where the nest is. So they want to make sure that they know the whereabouts of these nests because it's a critical time of year because what's going to be happening in a little while here is that they're going to be making their queens. And the way wasps work and hornets work, when they make their queens at the end of the year, they don't uh, have a perennial nest the way honeybees do. See, honeybees use the same nest potentially year after year after year, and they stay in that hive, and there they are. Wasps, vespids, don't do that. So what they do is they generate queens at the end of the year. They all fly out in all directions. And this is how they expand. And that's what everybody's worried about is the expansion. The queens will dig into humus, get into rotting wood, underneath rotting logs, piles of leaves, things like that. They overwinter independently. And then in the spring, those individual queens fly out and each queen starts its own new nest. That's why it's very important to get the specimens. When you find the nest, you notify the authorities so that they can go and get them. If you do a Google search on the Asian giant hornet, you're going to see found in Ohio, found in Indiana, found in Texas. Well, I can tell you that 99.9% .9 of the time, well, so far, 100% of those reports have not proven to be Vespa mandarinia, but are more than likely something else like Vespa which is the European hornet, 
or sometimes it'll be a big wasp like the tarantula killer or the cicada wasp and things like that. So if you're in doubt as to what you're looking at, don't just put the word out and say, I've got a giant hornet right here. They're lying to us. They're actually getting everywhere. They're really not. Uh, so departments of entomology, local uh, Department of Agriculture, the extension offices and things like that are more than ready to respond to that when they're going to want pictures. So get pictures of it. But usually they're dead. So the other thing is they had problems with tracking them in the past because the glue wouldn't hold. So they put these little trackers on the thorax of the specimens they caught out and away and they were catching them, baiting them with orange juice of all things. So and they have again websites that will show you how to make traps and stuff if you're in that area. And of course they have traps in every direction from every area that they've found specimens so that we can make sure to find out how far they're flying, uh, where they might be spreading, and they think that they have them under control. Those things can fly 50 miles an hour. That's right. So are they dangerous? Well, if you harass their nest, it's a good risk there. So even if you're a beekeeper, you put on your bee suit, that stinger is a quarter inch long. So the way our bee suits work is the fabric interrupts their ability to get the stinger into your skin. So what it does, is it really creates space. That's why sometimes when I go and I'm looking at something that's really defensive, uh, like these European hornets maybe, once you get to their nest and you start looking at that and you're putting your, your boroscope in there and you want to see how the nest is configured with live specimens in it, you want to wear something that's thick enough to make sure the stinger can't reach your skin. That's all you're doing. So and remember, unlike bees, they can sting you over and over. The problem with um, these large Vespa mandarinia specimens is that they can also deliver a lot of venom. It's a large insect. So, and it has the ability to cause a necrotic effect on your skin, which means it destroys skin cells, which means it leaves permanent scars that your body doesn't heal from. So it can turn into a real mess. The venom is a protein, a complex protein like all venoms are, and they do a lot of damage. So if you find one, report it, but it's not dangerous to you unless you live in the immediate vicinity. The other thing is they found like the first nest was right near a house. So it's pretty interesting. So we have to wonder how many of the nests might be out there. And back to the glue question, they're actually using Kevlar thread to hold the trackers on now. And they find that when they, they revive them after they've knocked them out with CO2 or whatever they're using, then they get that uh, Kevlar thread on there with a little tracking device and they fly off as if it's not even on them. So they've got that solved. They can track them and uh, they're on top of it. So that should answer that. Like a lot of things, they're dangerous if you harass them. It's not something you have to be really worried about, although some beekeepers uh, in that area might be wondering, how do I keep them out of my hives? How do we keep them from exploiting my bees. Well, I can say, now keep in mind, I don't have any specimens to evaluate, but looking at the physical dimensions of the body of the Asian giant hornet, if you had one of these little hive gate systems on your hive, it's not to use that to promote the hive gate, but these are things that I think about when I'm looking at ways these might be used. They can't get in through that opening at all. So could they hunt your bees out and about? Sure but they can't wholesale converge on your hive, invade the hive, take it over, and then exploit the resources while they defend that position and then later, of course, attack subsequent hives. So something like that, a tiny entrance reducer of some kind, a screen on the front, for example, that your bees can pass through, but the hornets cannot. So if you look them up, you'll see physical dimensions of the size of their head and things like that. But uh, they're really inadequate in their physical description description of the adult hornets because I was looking specifically for dimensions on the thorax itself. And that's because I want to know the thorax of a bee or any wasp remains the same. It's their abdomen that grows and shrinks as they're fed or not fed and so on and through their lifespan. So once they're mature and they're adults, they've hatched out and they're flying, that thorax size remains the same. That's the key. We want to know the dimensions of the thorax so we would know if we could build a screen for the front of our hives that uh, would be big enough for bees, drones, queens, if they were, you know, if the queen was on her virgin flight or something like that, or if they're swarming and you don't want to stop that, then you would have to put a screen out there that would allow your drones, which are the largest bodied bees inside your hive, 
and of course the queen would be able to go through and then of course your workers big enough to accommodate all of those but small enough to prevent the adult uh, giant hornets from getting into your hive so coming up with a screen that's going to be popular probably too so right now I don't know if you found a place that shows the physical dimensions of the thorax of an Asian giant hornet adult post it please down below now sometimes people will post a link in the comment section and it doesn't show up right away that's right links get held and then they get released later so don't be frustrated and don't keep posting it when you see that it doesn't show up in the comment section below a video right away because we get a lot of spammers around here so we have to deal with that anyway dangerous leave it to people that know what they're doing most of the people that have been killed by them in uh, Asia uh, were killed when they were trying to steal their larvae to sell them in the market so they're raiding nests they're at the nest site we know that honeybees are most offensive when we're at their hive same thing for hornets and wasps so don't raid them if you don't want to have them attacking you Oh, the other thing was the last time I spoke about the bee scanning app for your phone, which uh, was for taking pictures of frames of brood, uh, brood frames with the workers on it. So we're photographing nurse bees to see if there are phoretic mites. Phoretic varroa destructor mites are those that are out of the cells that are on the bees themselves or scurrying across the surface of the comb and things like that. So, and I made mention last time about how, wow, we really need some kind of algorithm where... Uh, if that shows phoretic mites on the bees, and then we should take into account the percentage of mites that might be on the underside of the bees that we wouldn't see. So is there a correlation? If you see three, will that mean there's probably nine on the frame and so on? Well, this was really cool because the bee scanning people contacted me right away and sent me a really cool letter that they have been working on that and that there already is an algorithm and... Uh, it talked about you know taking the images and everything else so their app has improved so it will show you and there will be an alert when you scan your frames usually that's four photos for a standard deep Langstroth frame close-ups of the bees here's the frame here's your phone right here not shooting it from way back not shooting it from really close there are instructions on their website it's called bee scanning and if you have just two hides or less it's free and there's another one which I just subscribed to this morning myself the premium app which is $39 for an entire year I got no discount I don't get anything for promoting them to you they didn't offer me a discount so I'm just telling you about it so they have actually worked it out uh, let's see the AI the accuracy is about 80 percent meaning that AI finds 80 percent of the visible mites which is enough to diagnose less than one percent infestation with rather few bees in the images. We recommend 2,500 to 3,000 bees in a collection. That equals about 10 to 12 images under normal bee coverage conditions from a 21 centimeter distance from the frame. And they, and I'm just gonna read part of the letter here. It says, you mentioned more data will give us more knowledge. In fact, our database now contains 150,000 analyzed images and we have not yet received a single complaint about the analysis quality. So we soon will improve the analyzing speed, which means after you take the picture, you submit it, when do you get the results back? You get your results back while you're standing right there by your hive. So this is handy because if you're standing there, normally you would have to do a mite wash. So if you're gonna do a mite wash, it's involved, time and material. And you're going to use your mite watch, you're going to get 300 bees, you're going to divide it by three, and you're going to have your percentage of mites that show up in your mite watch container. In the meantime, if you took these photos of the frames and you sent them in, you go on to the next frame, you take photos of the back side of the same frame of brood and you start taking those pictures. First of all, you don't risk killing your queen in your wash. The second thing is it actually sometimes shows your queen in the results. They tell you about it. It also identifies brood conditions. So if you've got a potential brood disease situation, the app now is also showing, look at this, it shows you a close-up. they have a mark over it and what they suspect that it is. So you can see brood disease and take action to get a closer look at that. The other thing is, you know right away, if you have a high mite count, it has an alert right on it, may require treatment. So then you take another look if you wanna do a wash then 
or if you want to just take it at face value and, and follow their guideline, which would say that it would require treatment, then you can treat. So it's a big time saver and material saver if you're out there doing that. And you can go right into your mite treatment. Yeah, you could begin right then because you're already in the hive and everything. You know, it needs treatment. So if you're going to use Formic Pro or something like that, look at our temperatures here now. You're in the temperature zone for Formic Pro for treatment. So anyway, it was really good. Check out the app. Check out the source. That's question number three. I just wanted to give you an update on that, that what I was speculating that maybe we need this big database and everything else. They've been compiling the database and making those references already, so they're ahead of the game. I was really impressed that they wrote to me too, by the way. Very cool. The next question, number four, it's from A. Mall. I did a hive inspection today. I have double deeps. One honey super, about full of nectar, and I found honey on outside frames of the top deep, brood, eggs, and larvae capped drone brood towards the middle found queen swarm cells on the bottom of the middle frame four of them all had larvae and were still open once i found the cells i backed out seems too late to split i'm in the northeast so what did i want to say um If you want to relieve this congestion, but you don't want to split them, it's it's hard sometimes for me to understand what the question being asked is. Uh, seems too late to split. You don't have to split them because they're going to naturally start to back off on their brood production as we get later into this month in the northeastern United States. But one of the things that you could do, and this is something I highly recommend going forward, is that people get... Um, nucleus boxes and have them handy as resource boxes because here's what you can do in a time like this if you want to stop these queen swarm cells which are in production right so they're stimulated to swarm but I've also seen this happen where they start swarm cells and then it gets cold or the weather turns and then they chew them up on their own but if you want the insurance of making sure that they don't go through with their plans to swarm and this is a good time to catch them while the queen cells are still open and in production. The difference between a queen cup, it's empty. Queen cell has eggs or larvae in them and they are developing. So that's the stage we're at here. So we have to pull the queen out because that's what they want to get rid of, right? So if you had a nucleus box, and I highly recommend you don't buy the temporary style nucleus boxes that are you know, the flimsy fold-out ones that come together, go to a place like Better Bee. I get no kickbacks, by the way, when I mention Better Bee. It just happens to be a place that I enjoy doing business with right now. They have the full wooden five-frame deep nuke boxes that'll work and last for a very long time. So you're not, it's not a one-and-done thing or filling it with bees, selling them off, and, you know, now you don't have your box anymore. So I recommend having those because I did that this year and I doubled the number of nucleus colonies that I keep right now. And uh, in a situation just like this, we want to do a number of things. One, we want to remove the congestion in the hive. So we're going to pull frames, a couple of frames of bees. And we're going to pull frames of brood. We're going to pull the queen with those. We're going to put those in a five frame nucleus box. And then we're going to push all the existing brood and resources together to the middle, and then we're going to provide extra space on the outside. And if you have drawn comb, this is key. Drawn comb needs to be right next to the brood area so that they can expand because that's one of the triggers that causes them to make preparations to swarm at an inappropriate time of year like right now. So by doing that, now we've got resources for them to lay eggs. The queen uh, is gone but now they know that they've got more resources, squash and remove those queen cells. And then we'll see if they start to make a new queen cell or an emergency cell because now the queen's disappeared. When they do that, you squash that too. Then you wait until all the open brood is gone and then you restore those frames because that queen in the new nucleus colony continued her production, continued making brood, they continue to expand that colony, even though it's small, because even two frames of bees, by the way, you're talking over 5,000 bees. So there you go. Plus, the queen is still laying, the pheromone is still strong, and they're genetically connected to that colony that you're pulling them out of. So then, once all your brood has run its cycle and they're all capped, so they cap at the ninth day, 
then you know that uh, the queen has been away long enough and now we restore those frames and restore the colony and hopefully by then because now we're talking the end of september or the last week of september and that's when uh, they'll be less likely to swarm and we'll have a single hive once again so we relieve the stress we give them additional space we gave the queen a place where she could still be attended to by her retinue of nurse bees. She can still lay, they can still reproduce, and that nucleus colony will grow. And then we combine them again later. That's what I recommend. There's a lot of things to do, but that's much better, much better than doing an actual split, which earlier in the year you could do, where you split the resources and you create separate colonies of bees. And then what we end up having this time of year are two small, very weak, and possibly incapable of surviving winter colonies. What's the best way to provide extra frames with cells ready to go? Better comb. Better comb I'm only using in brood boxes or in the first super above the brood box, which is all for the bees, which does not go through the extraction process. Lots of other ways to do this, but that's what I personally would recommend that's the end of question four. Now on to question five. Wayne from Bloomington, Indiana. I have Lance Hive, 13 drawn frames with a frame that is almost completely filled with pollen on one side and mostly filled on the other. This is only my second summer working with bees, so I'm not sure what to do with this. Do I leave it? Should I remove it? The other frames have brood and honey. Thanks. Okay, so for beginning beekeepers, Sometimes it is kind of a surprise when you're inspecting your hive and you pull up a frame and it's wall to wall pollen on that frame. And usually that frame of pollen is adjacent to your brood frame because that's the pantry and there's the nursery and they need to go back and forth because that's bee bread. The pollen from flowers is the protein necessary for them to produce baby bees. And so we're going to go into fat body be production later on and do i leave it or do i remove it you definitely leave it that's a fantastic resource especially this time of year so if you've got a frame full of pollen that alone even if they brought in no more will produce a frame of brood from start to finish so i would definitely leave it so there you go leave your pollen keep that pollen you get all that they're good to go and it's going to help them it's going to keep the nutrition high at a time when they're going to produce those fat-bodied winter bees here in the next month or so. Question number six. This is from Selena. Let's see. You are a fan of slatted racks. What do you think of incorporating them into the long Langstroth hive? So the long Langstroth hive that I have, and for those of you who don't know, it's a regular Langstroth frame, deep frames, and it's a horizontal format, and the frames just stack one after the other. And the way I've done it, there's a single entrance, and then we move along, mine's five feet long, and so on. Slatted racks, we put uh, directly on the bottom board of a standard Langstroth beehive, and then the brood box goes on top of that. Slatted racks are designed to give them a little extra space under there, so it helps with the uh, bearding that happens on the front of hives and uh, I can't always tell if there's a big reduction in the the bearding but it definitely provides more space for them and it also gives you a space where if you're treating with oxalic acid and you're using uh, the irons when you slide it in the bottom it interacts with the slatted racks themselves not the actual frames of uh, honeycomb so less chance of burning things in there although under the slatted racks there's enough space and sometimes they do run comb down there, but it just provides more space. It also makes the entrance of your hive darker. So when there's a slatted rack here and here's your landing board, the entrance is here, but the slatted racks have a front piece that is solid. Therefore, the light from this entrance and the cold air and the gusty winds and things like that don't go straight up into the hive. There's a barrier there. That barrier also is a place where sometimes in the wintertime, dead bees accumulate on top of that and don't plug up the hole in the entrance down below as quickly as they otherwise would. So there's some practical uses to it, but would I add it to a horizontal hive? No. And the reason I wouldn't do it is because uh, the bees have demonstrated that they keep that horizontal hive super clean. Uh, the other thing is the entrance is at one end and part of the function of that slatted rack is to provide extra space for the bees to hang out at the entrance where the airflow exists. See, because other than that, the bees that are unemployed gen generally gather 
high and in the back of your hive, so not around the slatted rack. So running them under the bottom creates hiding places for beetles and other pests. And so I don't want that inside the hive. One of the things I've thought about that I might add if I built another horizontal hive would be uh, some people have built them with screens and trays that pull out. I might add something like that just so I can see under the brood area if we've got mites falling in the trays, part of integrated pest management. So that might work. But uh, other than that, I would not add that. So let's see. Also, I recently bought a queen for a hive I thought was queenless. When I put one in, I purchased the bees were not accepting her. So I pulled her out because they were trying to sting her in her cage. I took her out and gave several frames of brood, bee bread, and honey from other hives because I did not want to waste the queen I bought, and I put them in a seven frame apame hive. I keep feeding them only from a couple other strong hives. And the new queen has started laying. I'm a little concerned because there's no bee bread. Should I be concerned? Maybe put a pollen patty in there. Well, there must be some bee bread coming in because they're feeding their new, newly hatched eggs. Eggs hatch on the third day. Then we have open larvae and they get fed. So if those are being fed and they're bringing it in, not sure they might be bringing in the pollen, committing it to bee bread, processing it, and then feeding that to the developing larvae and producing royal jelly and everything else they need to start them off right then uh, if they're feeding them, then there is some coming in. So would I add in pollen patties and things like that this time of year? Now, this is something that is very polarizing among beekeepers. Feeding pollen patties in the fall, does that boost your bees and improve the overall health and well-being of the colony or chances of them surviving and going into spring uh, without expiring during wintertime? There's not a lot of variance in that. Therefore, it may be that you're wasting your money if you put pollen patties in because they're expensive. If the environment is still providing some pollen, they're still developing brood, I personally would not put a pollen patty in there. So, because remember, my target group for this entire series is backyard beekeepers. We're not commercial beekeepers, so we're not worried about our commercial commitments early next year. So we're not trying to really build enormous colonies going into the fall or keeping the numbers up or kicking off brood early going into spring so that we can have the numbers necessary to head out and provide pollination services. What we're trying to do is keep bees in our own backyard, in our environment. So the less that we have to supplement those bees, it seems like the better off they are. I have uh, colonies that I attend to and I have colonies that I ignore. And let me tell you something, the colonies that I ignore are doing extremely well. It's like it makes me wonder, why am I helping the little underdog colonies along with extra feed and extra stimulants and things like that in order to see if I can get them to do better? They really have not, and remember, this is small scale. I currently have 21 colonies. That's it. So I don't have the hundreds to make my consensus from. But uh, the ones that I ignore and do nothing for tend to really explode on their own. So it really comes down to the bee stock that we're keeping, the bees that do the best, bees that we propagate from because they're awesome. So much more. So for this particular circumstance for Selena, if I'm assuming that this is a backyard beekeeping operation, I would not be putting pollen patties in there. I would let them continue to bring in what they're getting from the environment because they're getting it somewhere because they're feeding what's already developing. So that's the end of question number six. Question number seven, Susan Quitter from Bronson. Can you explain the purpose and benefit of slatted pieces between your bottom board and the brood box? Caught a glimpse in your episode 120, but I'm unfamiliar with them. Okay, I already. the good news is I already covered that. Slatted racks, and I should have brought one in here to show but I have lots of videos showing those, but the benefits we've already discussed, extra space, shielding from winter breezes and cold gusts of wind, darkens the entrance. The queen uh, will lay closer to the entrance, lower on the frames, where sometimes if you don't have a slatter rack and you've got a solid bottom board, for example, uh, even though the brood concentrates near the entrance, because that's where the best ventilation control is, 
but uh, they won't often use the cells all the way down to the bottom. So with that extra space, that slatted rack, which is about two inches thick, uh, the queen does tend to lay eggs all the way down to the bottom of the frame. So you might be getting more bees that way. So that's one other thing. Question number eight. Joel Zinn from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. I recently came across the Cirocell Top Feeder and wondered what you thought about it. I know you like the wrap it rounds, and that is what I've used, but even with the sock trick, the sock is something we put over the top to give them better footing, I lost a lot of bees. I wonder if the Cirocell would be any better. So I have a large Cirocell feeder over here. This is what they look like, and they come in eight frame or 10 frame, and, and there's other variations of this, but this is the gist of it. This is a 10 frame Cirocell feeder. This holds a lot of liquid. In fact, I'm surprised. Oh, I did write it on here. So it holds, it has a two gallon mark, which is to here, and it has a one gallon mark. That is a lot of syrup. And in general, it's gonna hold more syrup than you need. Now, the other part of this is, we have a wooden frame that goes around it. So this occupies an entire surface area for your hive. So you've got a ceiling surface underneath. The bees come up through here. They go down these edges, they access your syrup, and then they go back up and they go back in. And of course, just like we described with the other feeder, the rapid round feeder, you can leave this cover off in wintertime and you can dump your dry feed in here too. So the only reason I don't like it is if I want to take this and clean it and take care of it, where if I do that with a rapid round, I just bring another rapid round in, I put it in its place, it's already clean, I take the dirty one away and I go sanitize it, and then it hits the shelf and it's ready to go. Just like over here, we have a bunch of extras. When it comes to this rig, they're more expensive. And uh, the other thing is, do bees not die in it? Well, I have a member of our bee association that bought one of these and he had problems with bees because they also access the corners here. So they come up, there's these little shields that keep them from floating out in your syrup and piles of dead bees in these too. So it's a matter of what you want to do. If you want to have a wooden frame that is part an integral part of your hive. The other thing is we have the underside of it here. When you put the wooden frame here, um, just know that they're going to attach burr comb and things like that to it too. So when it comes time to pull this up to replace it or to go and clean it or something like that, you're dealing with that attachment structure underneath. But uh, some people like them. I personally don't just because I can swap out the whole thing. These are handier, easier to clean. This one, if you took it out to clean it, then the whole thing is exposed. Unless again, you own another one that you can have clean on the shelf ready to go. So you pull this one off, you put that one in. When you're holding so much syrup, if they're not drinking at all, then the syrup spoils. So then you have to do something about that too. Some people add a little bit of bleach to it to extend the life of the syrup. Some people add a little um, honeybee healthy or some essential oil that keeps it from spoiling. The other thing is the free surface area on this. Free surface area on a rapid round. We tilt our hives slightly towards the landing board in winter time, and some people leave it that way all year round, which I recommend you do, because even heavy rainstorms, we don't want the water to go in the hive, especially if you have a solid bottom board. So if it tilts forward a little bit, the free surface area on this one is not as long, right? So if it tips a little bit, the bees are still gonna get most of the syrup out of it. If this is on your hive and you tilt your hive forward, the free surface area means that down here, you're gonna be limited to the depth of syrup that you're gonna put, and over here on this end, it's gonna be very shallow. So we know that when the bees can get to the bottom here, on this one, this is actually better than the rapid round as far as the bees cannot get underneath of it and get out into the surface area and drown in the syrup the way they can with the rapid round. Because the rapid round, when you come to the bottom there, if the syrup is drained out on one side, the bees have a tendency to go out underneath that clear cup and out into the syrup and then they get stuck and they drown. So from the free surface area, you would have fewer dead bees here, but here you would have less access to the syrup because by the time they get down here to where they're using it up, you've got a bunch of syrup on the deep end, unless your hive is perfectly level. If it's level, that's defeated and a non-issue. These are just things that you can think about. Higher capacity, 
greater free surface area. Bees do not have access to float out either from the corners. So now your bees can go to the corners and use the deep end over here if they access it because it's over here. So if you've got that set up for them and they can access this corner through the feeder, then that would probably satisfy the deep free surface area too. So maybe I just talked myself right out of that criticism, by the way, because I forgot about these corners. So yeah, those are the comparisons. And it's a matter of, I don't know what these cost right now because I bought this a long time ago. I don't put them on my hives just for the reasons that I described. But if you need a large capacity and you're in a rapid building mode there, then, uh, but a friend of mine, of course, in our club said it had a lot of dead bees in it. He was a little disappointed that I reviewed that and didn't give those cautionary statements. So those are just the differences and why I prefer the wrap it arounds cheap. I can get a whole bunch of those for the price of one of those. And that's an integral part of your hive because of the wooden frame. Those are not, those are just in and out of your feeder shim. So I hope that helps. Do, 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 Question number nine. This is from RP Smithville, Mississippi. I have a question for you. I have two hives that I call yellow and blue. The yellow hive is doing well, but they don't have a lot of stores. I started feeding them one to one last week. The blue hive has plenty of stores, but no queen. They swarmed just over three weeks ago and left plenty of queen cells. I inspect every week and as of three weeks ago, all cells were open and today I still have no sign of a queen. So that's three weeks since she had queen cells and as of today, no sign of the queen. So I'm trying to decide whether to order a new queen or just let them die and save their stores for the yellow hive. Not having any drawn comb was a problem for me because the bees couldn't draw it out fast enough and would swarm. Thanks for any suggestions. Okay. So we have hive B with no queen, but we had queen cells and it's only been three weeks. And now the cells have demonstrated that they're empty. So something hatched. I would give them another week to see if that queen can get out, get mated and get back because they can take a while to do that. Nine to 14 days really is your time zone uh, after the queen is hatched to mature to be able to fly and then to get back and then to start laying eggs after she's made it so then if at that point it doesn't happen would i say just let them die no i would take hive the yellow hive has a queen she's laying and they could benefit from the resources of hive b so i would take hive b i would put newsprint on top of your yellow hive I would cut little slats in that, spritz it a little bit with some sugar syrup and put hive B right on top of that and combine the hives, combine the populations and then let them blend. And then that would go into winter. And for me, that has worked extremely well in the past. So that's what I recommend. And of course, um, if you see new eggs and everything in that hive, then you're still good to go leaving them the way they are. But uh, if you don't see eggs, by the end of next week, combine them. Newsprint method. Oh, here's another one, number 10. This is from Jennifer. It says, I have a different issue. One of my hives was robbed out and I tried to save it, but to no avail. As I was removing the robbed out hive, the robbers started to go after my other hive. I overnighted a couple of Be Smart robber screens and put one on. Uh, overnighted so I had them shipped in overnight it seems to be working but i cannot tell if the activity has continued robbing or something else i'm noticing bumblebees trying to enter the small entrances of the robber screen and bald face hornets and yellow jackets my bees are fending these intruders off and there's very little wrestling on the landing board recently but i'm still worried i have each entrance open approximately one inch should i close one side or just keep both entrances small and no robbers and do robbers still rob out hives, even with the Be Smart Ultimate screens on? They sure can. Uh, it's just tougher for them. So this is one of the most recognizable emergency robbing screens that everybody gets and puts on because they're cheap, they're plastic, they're available. You keep them on your shelf. I have a whole bunch of them. And these little push pins on the top, they stick right on the front of your hive. And then you put these 
push pins in to hold them in place while they do their thing. So when you close off your hive, you still have venting through the front. So the robbers come and they hit this. They don't know what to do. But then you're opening these top pieces, see? And the resonant bees come in through the back. They go up through the top piece and they go out and they go off and do their thing. But when you're looking at your hive and you've already put one of these on, how do we know if the robbing is continuing? Or if uh, now these are just the resonant bees doing what they're doing. And the yellow jackets and the bumblebees, but yellow jackets, the wasps in general, this is the time of year when their activity, their invasive activity, starts to become really enhanced. You really see them pinging on all of your hives. That's where, and I hate to bring this up again, but those of you who are doing the hive gate citizen science group with me, these hive gates are proving worth their weight in gold when it comes to keeping yellow jacket wasps out of the hives. The inventor of this thing has videos of yellow jackets actually getting in and then getting lost inside and incapable of getting back out. So what does that do? It eliminates their ability to scout an area, find a resource, and get back to the nest to bring more from their nest of those raiders to attack again that beehive. So it was demonstrated that even tiny colonies, underdog colonies, and I have this on one, for example, I demonstrated my Colorado bee vac on a ground swarm that was very small, we put them in a single deep 10 frame box, not a nucleus colony, and we put this on it. Because I want to see if that tiny colony that otherwise would be doomed this time of year, because they'll be robbed by anybody. Honeybees are terrible robbers too. So a reduced entrance like this that requires them to travel all the way through here before they get inside, and then when they get down here, they're met with little defensive guard bees. So that long entrance is a deterrent because yellow jackets don't like to take the risk of going all the way in there. Now, one of the behaviors that we're talking about when we look at the front of it is that the robbing bees, when the robbing still continues, you see them moving all around the hive. Resident bees come to the entrance, they go through the entrance, they get in the hive, and then they, when they're done, they leave. Bees that have freshly robbed an area and filled up on resources. Do you know what they're doing when they come out on the surface and they're on the landing board before they take off? You'll see them wiggle their abdomen and they're like arranging the food that they just overfilled on that's in their crop. So you see a lot of moving the abdomen around and adjusting everything before they fly off. The other thing is they are dirty. So when they're robbing something, you'll see little bits and pieces of uh, what looks like propolis, like little dirty footprints, little spats all over the surface here. So they're dirtying things up on their way out because they've been tearing into stuff and just getting out of there. So if you see the, they're pinging around the back, they're looking at every groove and entrance, every area where little scents and odors are coming through, it's a great time to close off your upper entrances too because you don't want to give them more to defend than they have to. So we're down to a single entrance. So these do work. And I recommend, of course, only opening one side at a time. If your resident bees um, are already blocking the entrance, in other words, there's so much traffic, they're, they're jammed up and they can't get in and out, and you're sure it's not robbing anymore, then you could open up both. But if it's a smaller, weaker colony, I would just open one side or the other, not both at the same time. And if things are getting out of hand and there's lots of robbers, you can close these off and uh, not let anybody enter out until that subsides. And then try again the following day because once, here's an example of you want to really control the first experience that the scouting robbers have. And you do that by having a very small entrance and giving your resident bees the ability to defend it. So if this was your entrance, you can go to a wooden entrance that's smaller if that's a full-size colony, they can defend that, no problem, and still vent the areas. If you've got a tiny colony, late season swarm or something like that, then your entrance should also be very tiny. And the way you gauge whether this is too big, not too big if things can get by, so the yellow jackets are the most obvious thing this time of year. If they scoot in, get right through there, as soon as they get inside, they cut around down the side or they cut up the surface of the wall inside. That opportunity for that behavior is defeated by things like hive gates. Long, narrow entrances means they have to go farther to get in. And when they come out, they're right under the cluster. They're not in a hidden area 
tracing along the wall and then up the side and then getting into areas that are less defended. So a smaller thing like this, that again, doesn't cause a huge traffic jam of the resident bees, then small entrances this time of year when things are cooling down in particular. Big hive, little hive. Big population, small population. And actually some of the really tiny entrances perform extremely well even with large populations. So even these little entrance reducer wheels that you can put on and have just close off the entrance altogether and just have a single, you know, this looks like it's about three quarters of an inch. So a three quarters of an inch opening there, but then you can even reduce that more by moving this just a little bit and closing off part of that entrance. Every one of my nucleus colonies has only half of the entrance hole exposed and they're super populated. Works really well. So that's my advice on that. Moving on to question number 11, Brad Oliphant. Need your expertise on something. As I might have mentioned, I've managed to have zero Varroa this year. That's outstanding, by the way, Brad. <clears throat> and yet, it's a few days from September and want to offer a brood break regardless. What kind of cage would you recommend me using to cage the queen? How long can I keep her in there without hurting her? I would appreciate any suggestion. Okay, so here's the thing. The first thing that hits me about this question is zero mites, but I want to do a brood break. If you have zero mites or low mite counts or your mites are fewer than two per hundred, so less than 2%, I wouldn't be doing a brood break. So, the, and I'll put a link down in the video description associated with this question, and I'll show you what the cage is. There's a wire cage, number eight wire, um, hardware cloth, and Better Bee sells them, Daydont sells them, other pieces sell them. And you push them right onto your brood frame with brood under it, queen's in there, the brood hatches, they attend to the queen, the queen continues to lay, and she's controlled. Meanwhile, the rest of your colony uh, goes on and reduces their brood production at a time of year when we really need them. So this is actually a terrible time of year to be interrupting brood uh, as a means of controlling varroa mites. And if I had zero mite counts, I would not be doing it. For every day that the queen is not laying her eggs out and around on that frame at the other end, on the other frames in the hive, you are losing more than a thousand new bees a day. So the trade-off is pretty big because in order for a brood interruption to be meaningful as a mite control, that's going to have to go for 10 to 14 days. So if you look at the other end of that and you didn't have a mite problem to begin with, um, interrupting them for that length of time, I think this time of year is a mistake and not something that I would do. But anyway, the cages are four inches by five inches. So the queen's got lots of moving area. She's going to continue to lay every time one of those new ones hatches out. But of course, by the time she lays eggs, she'll fill the area. Keeps her pheromone in the hive. Keeps the um, nurse bees actively taking care of her. So your queen's queen, right? She's good to go. She just doesn't have access to the rest of the colony. Personally, I wouldn't do it. For the reasons I mentioned. Now we jump to number 12. Yvette. Can you please give me a tip on what to rub on my hummingbird feeders to keep the bees away? I tried peppermint oil, olive oil with garlic and tea tree oil, and none of them worked. Here's what I would recommend that you put on your hummingbird feeders to keep bees and wasps from also feeding at them. Nothing. Instead, I'll talk about a different style of hummingbird feeder. A lot of hummingbird feeders are bottles that are up like this. And those bottles, of course, keep this reservoir full of nectar for your hummingbirds so that they can come and they can get into the little fake flowers and stuff and they can get the nectar out. And this particular one's had, this one has a water trough area in the middle that acts as a moat to prevent your ants from getting in there. But here's what I say to do. Get a different, different style of hummingbird feeder. This one just has the reservoir. I would fill this feeder up to within a half inch of the top. And guess what we just did? 
By putting your Nectar Free Hummingbirds less than a half inch or more than a half inch from the top and that's overkill, the hummingbirds can still get to it. Your bees, your bumblebees, and even the ones with the longer tongues can't get to that to drink the nectar. So you solve your wasp and bee problem. You just have to get a different style of hummingbird feeder. This one is by Aspects Incorporated. A-S-P-E-C-T-S -E Incorporated. Nothing to do with those people, but this will hang. And this is a common question they get. The bees are all over my feeder. If you're a good neighbor and you're a beekeeper and your neighbor loves hummingbirds and your bees are all over their bird feeders, buy them some of these and give them to them. That will go a long way to healing issues between you and your neighbors, but the ones with the bottles on them that keep the reservoir full, that keeps the nectar up near the surface so the bees can access it. Get it below, away from those ports where the bees feed, or put little port extensions on, make those thicker. So if you can modify something, if you're handy, and you can do something to make those little flowers that they feed from a little taller from the feeding system itself, then you've also satisfied that and your bees can't reach it and the hummingbirds can. So rubbing all the repellents and stuff, I think is, is a waste of time. So mechanical, let's think about how long are their tongues and what can they get to and let's make sure the hummingbirds can, but the honeybees can't. Next one, roachless. Do you know roughly how far bees will fly before defecating? I'm worried about the position of my hives. There's really only one good place in my small yard for them, and that is two or three meters, about 10 feet from my neighbor's washing line. Ooh. And uh, on one side and park cars on the other, the bees would have to fly up and over a high fence first, but I don't want to cause issues for my neighbors. Well, the only time that bees defecating is an issue when it's really messy is when they've been confined to the hive for a long period of time, like winter time. They can't fly, it's too cold, they do what's called cleansing flights, and that's where you can see your bees fly out and they're going to eliminate sometimes the minute they get out the door. And that's why you see these little brown streaks everywhere, you see brown spots in the snow and everything else. But when that happens, it's been my observation that the bees are doing all of that within 10 feet of the hive. So the minute they get out, they've been holding it. You know, they've been in traffic. They've drank a whole bunch of coffee. They ate a bunch of bran muffins. And then they find out there's a big line at the bathroom. And then by the time they do get to the bathroom, well, you know, it doesn't take long for everything to make its way back out of them. Same thing with the bees. So they're looking to eliminate fast. So I think you're safe. This, uh, 10 feet away i think they're going to eliminate within that 10 feet because when we see see winter's perfect time to see how far they go before they do that and uh yeah the little brown spots and everything on the dirtiest hives the hives with the highest mineral content and honey the darkest honey by the way produces the more the most bee poo yeah did you know so what produces the least amount of bee poo well that would be your sugar syrup because there's less in it. So like dark honey, you know, like buckwheat honey, that would cause a lot of bee poo. So, and that's actually been studied, it's pretty interesting. But as far as how far they go before they eliminate, it's what they're eliminating that would matter. So if, it, if they have dysentery or something, they're gonna do that, they have nozema, they're gonna be pooping all over everything at the hive. It's gonna be all over the front of it. So, um, so bee diarrhea. Yeah, it's only in winter that that's a real problem. Summertime, this time of year, and they're taking in nectar and everything's healthy. They can fly every day, fly as much as they want. Then their elimination, first of all, is very small, and chances are it's very clear. So you don't have to worry about it. I think we're okay. That was the last question of the day, so hopefully you didn't forget to click like over here if you're liking everything. The other thing is, this coming week, we're going to be looking at the Vespa Crabro, which is the European Hornet. I have them in a tree. I'm going to get a really good look at them, and I'm going to try to give you a really good visual and audio experience. We're going to look right at them. We're going to get right in there. The other thing is, this time of year, wasp nests are getting bigger. So they're at their peak. Their population is peaking, and that's why they're so strong. That's why they can attack your beehives and everything. So you might want to be aware, also, when people call and say, we've got bees, would you come and get them? A lot of beekeepers don't want to get them this time of year because if there's a swarm, 
you know, what good is that going to do you to bring them in? Number one, you're bringing in a swarm that doesn't belong to you. It's not your area. So if you've got a separate yard to keep them in, that's what I'm doing this year. I'm not bringing them to my apiary. Uh, but oftentimes it's not bees, it's wasps, it's hornets. So uh, it would benefit you to get a collection of pictures together of what those things should look like and sending them to people that are telling you they've got wasps. Uh, well, they've got honeybees when in fact they're just going to be paper wasps or something like that. So, and the nests are big. I just found a huge yellow jacket nest. It's like this. So I'm looking at ways to preserve it because I want to add it here to my, to my background because it has all the galleries in it. Very interesting stuff. Very cool stuff. So lots to look for. And... Uh, the wasp populations are going to be robbing everything. Also, if you have questions and you're watching this and you need your question answered right now, you don't want to wait till Friday. So join the Way to Be Fellowship. So if you go to Facebook groups, the Way to Be, you'll find it. And uh, answer a couple questions. How would you hear about it? Why do you want to be there? And we only accept friendly beekeepers that don't tear each other apart and get mad and all arrogant and everything. So... Good place to get your questions answered day or night. It's a very good fellowship there. And uh, I'm glad they're doing so well. So that's it for me today. Thanks for watching. And I hope you have a fantastic weekend. So thanks again. Good luck with your peace.